The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good, after, good morning, everyone. Welcome to ITMG's Professional Development Workshop. My name is Leanna Hunt, and I am the Director of Training and Outreach at ITMG. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's workshop will be recorded and all registrants will receive an email normally within two business days with a link to the recording, the presentation, and question and answer. We will also post this on our website at www.gotoitmg.com. Additionally, all attendees will receive an attendance certificate email within two business days of today's workshop. At the end of the workshop, there will be a short survey that will pop up and we do encourage participation in that so that we can continue to provide workshops that are valuable to those that attend. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll answer them throughout the webinar and also at the end of the presentation. I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker, Sherry Warner. Sherry is a geriatric counselor and licensed clinical social worker at the St. Vincent Medical Group Center for Healthy Aging in Indianapolis. Sherry earned her Bachelor of Social Work degree from Ball State University and her Master's of Social Work degree from Indiana University School of Social Work. Sherry is a member of the National Association of Social Workers, and at St. Vincent, she specializes in working with older adults that are coping with significant life changes and challenges. On a personal note, Sherry and I are fellow BSU social work students and have been friends for over 25 years. So I am very pleased to have Sherry join us today to share information on geriatric depression. And I'm now going to turn the webinar over to her. So welcome, Sherry. And Thank I am you. going to make you the presenter now. Okay. So you'll just need to show your screen and we'll be ready to go. Oh. Can there you, you go. Okay. I can, okay. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as Lana said, I am the geriatric social worker uh, counselor here at the Center for Healthy Aging. And I'm just gonna throw this slide in there and tell you a little bit about what we do and why this is my specialty. Um, I work in a, a medical clinic that, um, specializes in older adults, and we work a lot with people who have cognitive mentation issues as well as mood issues. Um, really look at things from a big picture, and I'm going to share a little bit with you um, a national initiative that Ascension, along with four other major health um, systems, have been invited to participate in with um, the uh, Initiation for Healthcare Improvement in Boston, as well as the John D. Hartford uh, Foundation. And this is a national uh, push um, to make healthcare age friendly. So I want to share it with you because I know that um, you guys are working with older adults. And um, hopefully, you will start to see this focus of care as you are working with your patients. And so I kind of want to go through these four M's before we get started on our um, information about the geriatric depression. Um, they have come up with this model. We've added uh, a fifth M called multimorbidity. But um, we are pushing forward this 4M model where we look at the big picture of medications, looking at polypharmacy, what high-risk medications are for older adults, and we'll talk a little bit of that in the presentation. Um, medication side effects that could be uh, untoward for older adults. Um, we're looking at mobility, high risk for falls, fear of falling, um, gait and balance difficulties, and how that impacts a patient um, overall, as well as mentation, so that's a, a big focus for us. Um, we diagnose dementia, a cognitive problems. We provide support for families um, and help kind of coordinate care through the system. Um, but there are many initiatives to look at using screening tools to catch these things early. Um, also looking at mood and depression. So that's where my presentation fits in this, into this mentation section. But the big thing of, of the 4Ms that I want to point out is the what matters. I think often um, when we come from a medical standpoint, we're looking at a, a diagnosis. You know, what is the problem and how do we fix it? Um, 
And one of the big pushes with this, this um, model is that we look at what matters to the patient um, in all of this. And whether that is from a medical standpoint or do we have someone, you know, an older adult who is um, trying to, you know, decide what their goals of care are and they tell us that, you know, I really just want to make, make sure that I am able to get to my granddaughter's wedding. Um, and it, if I'm in a wheelchair, that's fine, but I want to be able to do that. So are there health things that are, are that we can help contribute to? Um, I have a story around this one in particular. I was meeting uh, with a patient of mine who was referred to me by one of the primary care physicians here in the network. And um, she had been suffering some significant depression and her husband had died. They had a beautiful life together. Um, he died probably three or four years ago and she was facing some significant changes, some financial changes, needing to move, et cetera. Um, she fortunately had some resources and could make some decisions uh, about travel. And she decided that she couldn't deal with any of these decisions back home. And probably about two or three years ago, even though she had been diagnosed with renal cancer and had some difficulty with mobility and had done some physical therapy, um, she, she decided she was going to travel. And so she took a worldwide trip throughout the, the, the world, um, went for a good year, um, did some cruises, did some flights, um, and she went by herself and did this amazing travel. She came back. Um, she was struggling with the depression, was referred to me. She was having some trouble getting around physically, um, and so she was referred back to physical therapy. And her physical therapist said to her, I'm not sure that I am willing to work with you. Uh, the last time we worked together, I recommended to you that you not travel um, because I didn't feel that was safe for you. Um, and you went ahead and did that. You were non-compliant. So I'm really going to have to think about this. And she and I had a long conversation about, um, you know, how clearly this clinician in particular had difficulty looking at the big picture for her. That trip really represented for her um, a way to kind of get away from the grief that she was experiencing here and find some peace um, and experience some things before she had to come back and face some difficult things. So we talked about that and she was able to have a conversation with a the physical therapist about, you know, she wasn't just being non-compliant or, or uh, difficult, um, that there were reasons she wanted to do that. But, but that's, that's what I mean by what matters. So keep that in mind as you're working with your older adults that often if we can look at these four or five components of, of the four M's, um, we can get a much better picture of what's going on with a patient. So having that information, we're going to go on and talk about geriatric depression it is not a normal part of growing older. I think often we hear you know, if someone is depressed, well, that's normal. They're, they're older. Isn't that normal? It's really not. Um, while older adults go through many changes, as we know, um, a significant depression or a clinical depression is not normal. Uh, so while it's normal to feel blue, um, I think we all have those moments. You know, we have losses. We have changes. Um, sadness is a normal emotion. Um, but those feelings are often transient um, and we can usually get support and um, still function in our lives. Depression is a mood disorder that um, it does cause changes in how we think, how we feel, how we behave, and it can affect function. To be diagnosed with a depression, you must have the two symptoms that were symptoms that I'm really looking at is a change in function and a change in mood. Uh, and those things must be uh, persistent and uh, over the course of at least two weeks in order to be diagnosed with a clinical depression. And we're going to go into more detail about the diagnostic criteria and how things are a little bit different for older adults and kind of what to look for. Uh, how about I get to the right slide? Okay. Um, so the reason we want to look at that this is that depression is pretty relatively common over among older adults. 
There's an estimated 1% to 5% of people who are 65 and above who have been diagnosed with a major depressive episode, so a clinical depression. Um, what's interesting about this population is that for over half of these older adults, this is a new diagnosis to them. This isn't something they have um, experienced before in their life. We call that a late onset. Um, and so that that's an interesting piece there, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, it's more common among women than men um, in general, but this gap narrows as we uh, move into the older population. So it, is, it becomes more common for older uh, adult men uh, to start discussing and have symptoms of depression uh, rather than the younger population. Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, subclinical depression is um, what we is more common among older adults as well. Um, and what subclinical depression is is kind of that I, I think of Eeyore that okay, just a general low level depression that is significant. It's a dysthymia. It's something that is a low level. Someone who's just kind of um, depressed mood, generally not happy overall. And that is more common among older adults than it is younger um, people. And the other reason this is important is because um, this population uh, shows the highest rate of completed suicides um, and uh, people 65 and above. Um, so one interesting thing that I want to point here out here is that we were talking about the late onset, early onset. So early onset depression is a component where people have um, a diagnosis prior to the age of 65. Um, there tends to be a genetic component with that, and there may also be a higher prevalence of personality disorder or elevated scores on with personality traits among the people who have reoccurrent depression throughout their lifetime. That's early onset. Late onset, um, it appears that there's some risk or link between vascular risk factors and late onset. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, in uh, a, a couple slides ahead. Um, Okay, we're gonna leave that out. Um, there are two major types of depression. Uh, we have major depression, which is uh, depression, the symptoms, and we're gonna go through that a little bit, and um, occur most of the day, almost every day, for at least two weeks. So when we talk about a major depression, we're looking at mood, decreased interest in uh, previously enjoyed activities, um, in one of the future slides, we go through more of these, but but some of those common symptoms, also with a major depression, it has to interfere with daily life. Either with relationships, there's more conflict, you have a change in sleep habits, you have a, a trouble with um, the ability to function. So this is someone who has trouble getting out of bed, someone who... Um, isn't taking care of themselves, has a change in grooming habits, um, may come to work and is not, they're not getting their work completed um, or not um, interacting in the same way they used to at work. Um, an episode can happen once in a lifetime and, and that person never has another episode or it can happen multiple times throughout someone's life. And then we have the pers persistent depressive disorder, which used to be called dysthymia. And it is that low level depression, um, that Eeyore. Um, and I think we all know, <laughs> I love Eeyore, um, but it's that low, that low level, okay, if I must. Um, they ha that is a, someone who has to have two additional symptoms uh, such as low energy, low self-esteem, decreased appetite, et cetera. So those are the two most common types of depression. So we're going to look at the specific signs of depression, things that you want to look for in your patients as you're working with them. One of the things I really want to point out is, is you know, often people are afraid or reluctant to ask about signs of depression or even suicide uh, for fear that it's going to bring up um, or create or cause 
uh, some of these symptoms and research shows us that that's just not the case. Um, so don't be afraid to talk to your patients about what's going on with them from a mood perspective. Um, it helps us get them the treatment that they need um, and can help improve and you'll see it can help improve some other aspects of health. All right. Hmm. I don't know what I did there, but okay. So some general symptoms of depression, uh, someone who feels sad or hopeless. Hopelessness is a big symptom that we look for in depression in general. Inappropriate guilt. Um, I, I'm trying to think you might see this in someone. I, I have one. I, you know, I had a patient that I'm working with um, who's really invested in his grandchildren's life, um, which is fabulous. It, provides him with a lot of purpose, uh, which I think is significant among older adults, anybody, um, but particular older adults who have major life changes. Um, and he um, disagrees in how his son and daughter-in-law uh, implement rules with his granddaughters and uh, feels incredibly guilty that these granddaughters are dealing with the things that they are. Um, and it's an inappropriate guilt because this isn't anything he has any control over. Um, the decisions aren't abusive, so it's not something he can really intervene with. Um, he just disagrees about them and he feels like it's his fault. Um, and um, so that's an inappropriate guilt. He, he really has no cause. Um, so we work with him and, and looking at what, what does he have control over? Um, and for him, it's, it's maintaining that uh, unconditional love and support for his his grandchildren and providing them with as much uh, support and uh, stability as he can from his perspective. People who are depressed often feel worthless. Um, um, this is a big one, the loss of interest in previously enjoyed activities. This is someone who may have enjoyed going out um, to lunch with their friends or um, they were part of a garden club or something like that and suddenly they're not really participating in those activities anymore, um, maybe not volunteering like they used to. Uh, one example that I have and one almost uh, I think a good treatment um, intervention is that I've got a patient who um, lives alone, uh, has never been married and uh, worked full time, had a you know good full life, good support network of friends and family, and um, she began to experience some anxiety and depression, and began dropping out of some of these activities that she used to participate in, and really um, that was one of the significant symptoms of her depression. And uh, through the course of therapy, we looked at what are some things that you can do, um, some behavior activation. Um, and she developed a rule for herself that I thought was brilliant and has really worked well for her. And I've actually um, helped, have mentioned this to other patients who have started to implement this too, is that she's retired and has no obligation to be anywhere. And she has made the rule that she will not um, go more than three days without leaving her home. So if she is on day two and doesn't have plans for day three, she will make some kind of plan, whether it's to go shopping, uh, to meet a friend for lunch, to go to a museum, um, just do something to get out of the house. Cause she knows that if she remains at home on that third day, she begins to trigger some of that feelings of loneliness, worthlessness, um, and isolation. So that might be something that you look at with your patients is uh, how often do you really engage with other people and um, can you increase that in some way? So decreased energy and increased fatigue um, is a very common symptom of depression, change in a sleep pattern. Um, so one of the things with this is that um, one of the really, really common um, patterns is that someone is able to fall asleep pretty easily, but then will wake up early in the morning, one, two o'clock in the morning, and then have trouble getting back to sleep. That's pretty classic uh, depression. That doesn't mean that um, 
it's also not a, you know, it doesn't mean that you, if you have trouble falling asleep and then stay asleep throughout the night, that that isn't a symptom of depression. Um, it could be, uh, but that's a pretty classic sleep pattern change uh, that is associated with depression. Um, psychomotor agitation or retardation. This is, um, and it has to be observed by others. This is the person who talks slowly, who moves slowly, and you just want to shake them and say, oh my gosh, will you please just spit it out? Or, you know, come on, I've been waiting forever for you to get from point A to point B, and it's not that far. Um, so it's that really slowed psychomotor agitation or retardation. Um, that's usually pretty progressed um, in the depression process. Um, this is a big one uh, that I want you to kind of remember for our older adults is that diminished ability to concentrate um, because we're going to talk about kind of depression and dementia uh, and how they may mimic each other. But if you have trouble concentrating and if depression makes it hard for you to concentrate, you're not going to process information the same and you may have an increased difficulty with your memory. And therefore, you may have symptoms that look like a, de a dementia, but may be a depression. And this is another one that's more common among older adults is that di diminished ability to concentrate. Reoccurrent thoughts of uh, death or suicide, um, and that may be with or without a plan. Um, and I want to assure you that, and I know I say this, um, that you can ask someone, have you had thoughts of harming yourself or have you had suicidal thoughts? Um, I know a lot of people don't want to ask that question. And I think, you know, the whole myth of you're going to introduce this thought that they hadn't thought of um, is an issue. But the other issue is, oh, my gosh, if someone tells me that they're suicidal, that I have to do something about it. And that's true. Um, but we really want to capture these people because there is treatment for depression. Um, but I, I, I get it. If you're a, a physical therapist or a nurse or um, an aide and you ask someone about suicidal ideation, it's pretty scary if they say yes. Um, but hopefully uh, there are resources available to you that can help you kind of work through those uh, if you have someone who is um, suicidal. Uh, irritability. Um, I think this is more common or what you might see more in older men. Um, women too but you know with our older men it's not as uh, socially acceptable to uh, be tearful or sad and you may see a rise in irritability uh, more than that sadness so watch for that as well um, change in appetite leading to a change in weight by five percent either way a gain or a loss so this is where I usually look for feedback, and I know I don't get that on the phone, <laughs> but um, I want you to think about what um, what on this list is striking to you when you think about older adults. And anyone can chat in if anyone has ideas. And if not, I'll just throw it out there. Okay, these symptoms, are so common among other syndromes or illnesses for older adults. So sometimes it's really hard to suss out um, the difference. And so we're gonna look at some of the symptoms and how it may be different or characterized for older adults. Memory problems. So if you've got someone who's depressed and they have trouble concentrating, we may see memory problems. Confusion, same, same thought here is that if you are not able to track information, um, because you are depressed, um, you may look more confused than you really are. Uh, social withdrawal is significant for older adults. I mean, I think there's just a general uh, tendency for isolation among older adults, um, and it's easier for older adults to withdraw. So that's why one of the reasons I think this plan for the my my woman who is depressed and has her three-day rule is so phenomenal is because she really has this this guideline for I must get out because I know that that's the trigger that I become isolated uh, it's very easy to become socially withdrawn 
we see a greater uh, level of self-neglect. It's harder for an older adult to care for themselves. You know, getting dressed takes so much longer sometimes, depending on what's going on with a patient. Taking a shower, those things become difficult. And if someone is depressed, they are not going to do them. Um, so we may see more self-neglect among our older adults. Loss of appetite. Um, this is a hard one. This is one of those hard ones, but that can be a symptom of another illness. And we always want to rule out medical um, before we just assume that it's a depression. But a loss of appetite uh, and weight loss, again, that can mimic other illnesses, uh, but can be a symptom of depression. Here's a big one. Those vague complaints of pain or malaise that um, those somatic complaints. How many times have we heard our patient talk about their constipation or their bowel movements or their aches and pains? Um, I have a friend who is older and um, was complaining about some abdominal pain and I you know her really well. And so I said, so, were you upset by anything before you started to feel bad? Well, yeah, I got some texts about something that were really upsetting. Hmm. So, you know, it, we can't separate the mind from the body. And uh, older adults in particular really um, do experience more pain. Um, I don't know. Atlanta said how long we've known each other, and it's even a little longer than what she said. Um, and I know that I experienced pain more than I did when I was in my 20s. So um, I think older adults do have very valid and legitimate um, aches and pains, um, and they have more time to focus on it. So we may hear more of that. Insomnia, I already talked about the irritability and agitation. Delusions, we can have delusions with depression. It does not automatically um, indicate that someone has a dementia or a delirium or a mental health issue. Same with hallucinations, um, that our older adults are more prone to those delusions and hallucinations. All right. Any questions so far that anybody has? There are a few questions, okay. Sherry, if okay. you would like um, to answer. Um, sure. So, um, the first question um, is more related to uh, services and uh, asking if there are any satellite offices, I'm assuming uh, St. Vincent for evaluation. So we do Maybe have- Maybe outside uh, of the Indianapolis area, yeah. Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, our main office is here in Indianapolis. We do have a satellite site in Carmel, which is not too far from Indianapolis. And I know that we're looking to expand to Anderson and possibly down to Evansville. Um, we do have patients who come from out of state to come see us. We try and make it as painless as possible, but we don't currently have satellites other than um, Carmel at this point. Thank you. Um, another question <clears throat> is asking, um, what would be key items to look for or take note of uh, with older individuals that are um, not able to be verbal, so they're, they're not able to um, talk mm -hmm. about how they're feeling without making assumptions um, or place, or, you know, feeling like that that they may be depressed. So what what would be, if you have any ideas of things to look mm -hmm. for, you've mentioned some really good things. I think that you could see without someone actually telling you, such as loss of appetite, a weight loss, mm -hmm. some of that. Mm -hmm. um, anything else specific so, that you would think? Yeah. So I think that the those physical um, markers or measures would be important to look at, um, the sleep sleep challenges or the weight loss. But another thing is tearfulness um, or behaviors. Uh, so if you have someone who's nonverbal and can't communicate what their needs are, um, and you've gone through your list of they don't, they're not uncomfortable, they're they don't seem uncomfortable. You've ruled out medical. Uh, you've taken, you've done lab work, et cetera, um, and and the person continues to be agitated or irritated. Um, that may be a sign of um, depression. 
and our doctors here, you know, if we if we have someone come into the office and they um, they have changes in their cognition, um, now this doesn't necessarily speak to the nonverbal because um, we do have to have some verbalization when we're doing some of the testing. But if we have someone who uh, has a it has some cognitive changes, may look like a dementia, but um, have we think may be depressed because of some behaviors or irritability in particular or that agitation, we will go ahead and treat them for the depression and put them on an anti antidepressant um, to see if that helps um, minimize those symptoms. So sometimes even our docs go out into a couple of the um, assisted livings and a few of the nursing facilities in the area and they will, uh, if we've got someone who's really agitated, we don't want to use those psychotropic medications in general. But if we think someone's depressed, we're going to try and treat them for that because we know those medications are effective in general, more effective than our uh, dementia medications. So they'll go ahead and put them on a low level of sertraline and see if that helps. And if it does, then bingo, we hit it. Um, and if it doesn't, we may try and increase. Um, uh, but if not, we'll just go ahead and just continue that medication. So that irritability would be the other thing I would look for. Thanks. Thank you. And then, um, and I think you pretty much answered this question, uh, which would be, you know, looking at whether a person may be depressed or is more um, attention seeking. Mm, that's a very good question. And that is really, really hard to um, suss out. Um, what I would say, I would try and get a good history of what their mental health history has been. Um, if you've got someone who has had a long history of episodes of depression, you might be looking at some of those personality um, that we talked about earlier. Uh, because someone who has multiple episodes of depression may um, may have those personality traits that make it more likely that it's an attention seeking issue. The other thing is, and this is hard, um, you know, if someone's voicing suicidal ideation, then we have to, you know, just legally from a ethical and legal perspective, we have to address it. Um, state law says that we do. Um, our professional organizations say that they, that we do, but there are some things um, that if you notice a trend or a pattern with someone, um, you may be able to try and do some behavior uh, modification type things like ignoring. Um, if someone is tearful um, constantly, really just kind of pushing through that and trying to distract using some of those behavior techniques that we even use with um, dementia patients, you know, acknowledging, but then moving right along. Um, and that might help you try and figure out, is this really a, a depression or is this a behavioral attention seeking type thing? I don't know okay. if that was enough of an answer, but that might be a place to start. Sure, sure. Well, I think I'll let you go ahead and continue. And we do have a few more questions, but um, okay. I think I'll just kind of hold on those and let you continue with the information. Perfect. Okay. So it, it's hard to diagnose depression in general, but it's particularly hard among older adults. And here's why. There are so many symptoms that are common for other disorders that we're looking at in older adults. Um, that decreased appetite, the changes in patterns, apathy. Here is a huge one, and and I don't know why I don't have that in a as a symptom, but apathy or lack of initiative, um, or lack of initiation, is a huge symptom for older adults um, that may be wanting to do something but just not having the oomph to do it, um, and that is also a it can be the effect of a stroke. Um, there can be cardiac issues or um, vascular issues that contribute to that as well. Um, so apathy is a big one. Withdrawal and then that psychomotor uh, agitation or retardation can also be symptoms of other illnesses. 
Um, so that the symptoms are uncommon, but we also have um, that there are other illnesses that can be mistaken, the dementia. So that's a big one. Um, like I mentioned before, if you um, have depression and your processing is slowed by the depression, your attention is affected by depression, then you may not be uh, processing information uh, in a way that helps you remember or not be confused. And so it may look like a dementia. Um, so we will, in our office, what we always do is if, if it looks like there might be a depression, we will go ahead and give a, a preliminary diagnosis of cognitive impairment, um, possible dementia, based on where they are with their testing, um, depression, and we will treat that depression first and then have them come back and we will retest. And depending on the appropriateness, we're gonna treat with medication and we're gonna treat with counseling services if it's appropriate. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, thyroid disorders can be mistaken as a depression, vice versa. Arthritis, if you think about that as the inflammation um, uh, and depression can cause inflammation. Some cancers can be mistaken uh, as a depression, heart disease and stroke. So not only do we have symptoms, but we have illnesses and then behaviors. Um, you know, we have low level depression in older adults uh, or those somatic complaints more common in older adults. Uh, symptoms may be less obvious. Um, Help seeking, I think that speaks to the question that we just had a minute ago that um, someone may be uh, attention seeking or needs met by, um, you know, I, I do. I have family members who tell me, um, you know, she calls me crying at 11 o'clock and I, you know, I don't know if she's really upset or if she just is lonely and wants me to come over. Um, maybe a little bit of both. Um, and the functional decline. Um, so someone who is having trouble bathing, dressing, et cetera, is that because of a physical uh, issue? Is that a cognitive issue or is that a mood issue that they just don't have the initiative um, to do that? And then that demanding behavior can also be seen as, um, can be uh, related to behavior or it could be related to depression. So it's, it's sometimes it's really hard to figure it out, um, especially when you're, you know, when you're someone who um, it, it, the patient is at home. You know, if you're in a, a setting like an assisted living or a nursing facility, a rehab, um, and you have more time with them, you may be able to figure that out a little bit quicker. But if you're seeing someone intermittently, it becomes difficult. Um, so I want to take this, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this in particular, but I want you to look at this, that there are, you know, these illnesses can look very, very similar. Um, but there are some differences to try and help distinguish. Um, for instance, the dementia, the onset is usually very slow um, and progressive. Uh, a depression is not something, if someone comes in and says, well, she suddenly just started having trouble remembering everything, it was right after dad died. Um, we may be looking at a grief or a depression. So what are some risk factors for depression among older adults? Um, chronic illness. And what do many older adults have? Chronic illness. Um, so uh, we have that. If there's a family or personal history of depression, you're more likely. Um, this one, the loss of family member due to suicide is interesting. Um, they did a twin study and um, I'm trying to find my notes on this. Um, in that, I'm not finding them. Essentially, the results of the study were that people who had, here we go, um, the mortality rate for first degree relatives, uh, suicide victims is about 3.5 times higher than the general population. So it increases sig significantly um, if there's been a, a suicide in the family. And that's why that is often asked in, in the suicide risk assessment. Um, so we do have some normal changes in, in, um, cognition as we age. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that I require the use of a calendar 
and in my 20s I didn't. Um, so there are some normal things I would encourage you if you're you know concerned to go to the Alzheimer's Association website. They have a nice um, 10 signs um, article. Um, and it kind of really gives you the difference between, you know, losing your keys is pretty normal um, in general, but are you able to kind of track back through and do you know what the keys are used for? Um, that might be a little bit of the difference between a dementia and the normal changes. So there are some normal changes um, among age uh, or age related uh, changes. But there are some risk factors. So if someone has a mild cognitive impairment, you may be more likely to have a depression. Um, risk factors of having multiple losses and not just talking about people around them, um, spouse, children, um, you'd be amazed at how many uh, people uh, who are 65 and above have lost children. Um, it's not talked about much, but so many people have. Um, but also loss of function, loss of ability to um, make decisions without interfering children, um, loss of driving. I had one woman tell me <laughs> tell me that um, that when she had to give up driving, it was harder than when she lost her husband. Um, now that tells me something about her relationship with her husband, but I think that's a pretty significant statement. Um, loss of driving is really a loss of independence, and so that's pretty significant. So there are multiple losses that that population incurs anyway, um, so that is a risk factor. Um, isolation, we already talked about that. Social skills deficit, so if we've got someone who, and I, I do, I've got, that's funny, I have a, uh, I've had a couple gentlemen actually who were um, either accountants or engineers, and um, they said, I never had to like do anything social. I went to work and my wife took care of setting social things up and now my wife is gone and I don't know how to talk to people. Um, and they're pretty out forthright about that information. So that can put them at risk as well. Um, and people who come to old age with a limited set of coping skills are at risk. Um, and many people do, I can tell you that. Um, Okay, so the chronic illness piece. 80% of older adults have at least one chronic illness and 50% at least have two chronic illnesses. So that's huge in looking at this big picture is that you know, older adults are at much higher risk and, uh, and it goes both ways. You know, People with depression are more likely to have chronic illness and people with chronic illness are more likely to have a depression. Um, so some illnesses cause changes in the brain that may have a direct cause, stroke, Parkinson's, dementia, infections. Um, I will caution you though, um, well, let me back up on that. Uh, infections, malignancies, the cancers, et cetera, and uh, endocrine, um, endocrine dysregulation um, can have a direct role in causing depression. Um, and I would add heart disease to this. Uh, we know that there's a direct link there. There are some risks, risk factors. Um, we haven't quite figured out the links, but cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, dementia, osteoporosis. So there, there's an increased risk of de, de, uh, depression among people who have these illnesses. Medications, this is a big one. How many of you have patients who are on 10 plus medications? Probably many of you. Um, we would call this polypharmacy, and we actually do consults in our office for this. And I would encourage, if you have patients on 10 or more, I would encourage them to talk to their primary care physicians to see, are they appropriate for their age? There are some medications that are not. Um, it's called the BEERS criteria. Um, and they are high risk medications for older adults. You may be familiar with that, um, but have them look at that and see if there are any medications that they could change that might be safer and have less impact on fall risk, et cetera. But these medications in particular um, can uh, trigger a depression or be linked to a depression. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you, you have the information there. So if, you've got a, if you have a patient on any of these medications, you might, um, you might consider doing a screening for a depression and see how they're doing. 
The screenings that we use, um, there are a few. There's the PHQ-2, and if that is positive, we move on to the PHQ-9. Um, we also use the geriatric um, dement or depression screening, and there's a 15-item tool and there's a 30-item tool. Uh, we use that frequently as well. So the reasons aren't clear as to why there's this connection or link, um, but some of the things that we consider is that depression can cause a role in accessing healthcare. If you've got someone who has trouble getting out of bed, getting ready, isolated, um, they may not be someone who is, uh, I don't want to say capable, but less likely to engage in healthcare practices, uh, make it to the doctor, et cetera. Um, it, may have a harder time caring for themselves. So someone who's depressed um, may not be as compliant or adherent with their medications, um, may not see the value in, in adhering to the diet or the medication or what's been prescribed. Um, so that may be contributing. And then they're also exploring how physiological changes we see in depression, so that inflammation, et cetera, um, may contribute to the chronic illnesses. Um, also the abnormal abnormalities in stress hormones, metabolic changes that we see with diabetes, et cetera. So there, there are many things that they're still studying and we're trying to figure out, but um, all things that you can keep in mind when you're looking at depression in older adults. Let's see. So here are some other risk factors. We've talked a little bit about that, the history in family or your personal history, uh, suicide, cognitive changes. Um, and I think what's interesting is that, you know, we have this multiple losses that accompany growing older. And the thing is that, that that's pretty much something that's going to happen with most, um, if not all older adults. But there's something that's different among people who um, develop the depression or don't. Um, so I don't think we can say that that being older, it, that depression is normal for being older. Um, everybody experiences these things. So what makes it different? What What is different among these people who do develop the, the uh, depression? Because uh, it's not normal. Um, I think we've talked about all of those other things. All right, so for treatment, we've got um, medication, uh, many different classes of medication. I know we often use the S SRIs. Um, some of the SNRIs uh, can be helpful in treating pain as well um, and tend to be good in terms of um, helping with initiation. Um, a lot of geriatricians will start off with like a sertraline Zoloft uh, and uh, our geriatricians always have the motto, um, start, start low and go slow, because uh, older adults metabolize medication differently. Um, so we always want to educate our patients that you have to be, you have to take the medication even though you don't feel the benefits of it. Uh, it takes four to six weeks to feel those, those benefits, um, or the maximum benefits, and to call um, and do those follow-up appointments so that adjustments can be made. Um, if it's not as effective or it's not making a difference. There's now some gene site testing that they can do um, where they can um, do a cheek swab. We do this with our patients where we've tried a few different medications and it's not effective. Uh, we'll go ahead and send the genetic testing off to see um, which medications uh, look to be metabolized more efficiently by that person's genetic profile. And that's been very helpful with those persistent depressions. So that's a possibility. And um, we generally start there. And we often uh, encourage talk therapy as well, or psychotherapy. Uh, that's what I do here in this office. Um, and but, but what I will say is that if someone has a diagnosis of dementia, um, that's not really an appropriate intervention. Um, we know that it. Um, just empirically is not effective. Um, so, well, in order to be referred for therapy, there have to be certain cognitive um, 
pieces that that are still intact um, in order for someone to benefit from that. So we'll look at that before we refer someone to therapy. Um, but the combination of medication and therapy um, are, we know, to be the most effective method uh, of treatment in general. Um, so we will try that. And so we'll do a course of medication and uh, therapy, and then we'll retest them uh, after six to eight weeks. Um, exercise is huge. Um, and it doesn't have to be, it's funny, one of our, our geriatricians here says, you cannot say the word exercise to our patients. You have to say activity or something else because there seems to be this, um, I think it's just for the general population, but he would say it was for older adults in particular that that's just not part of the culture um, of people in this age category. Um, but any activity, whether it is um you know, going shopping and walking and being up and about. Um, sometimes we will encourage people who are mostly at home and have some physical, you know, have them get up hourly and do a walk around the house or a walk to the mailbox. Um, just being up and active is really important. Um, and then we do use electro electroconvulsive therapy still. We've got a physician here that we refer to that if someone has a persistent and significant depression, um, that it is a really effective method of um, therapy. We're going to try a lot of other things first, um, but it can be effective um, with our older adults. Some barriers to treatment. Uh, a lot of older adults don't like adding medication and particularly antidepressants. They see it as a uh, the, the stigma associated with treatment or um, a mental health issue. Um, the side effects to medication are not always what people want to cope with, the dry mouth. And they have other medications that are causing side effects too. So I, I feel them. Um, but dry mouth, uh, sexual dysfunction, um, some confusion with some of the medications. So you just have to be careful in what the physician chooses. Um, transportation, getting to treatment. We do have some therapists, uh, one in particular in this area that we'll refer to because she'll go to the home uh, if I can't get out there. Uh, and then some financial barriers. You know, a lot of our patients are on uh, fixed income of Social Security and have very little left over. Um, do know that if, you know, there are, there is Medicare coverage for medication and for um, as long as you have Part D, um, but Medicare uh, Part B covers counseling. Um, so know that. And to kind of summarize it up, how do you feel about the new antidepressant combo? Is it working? I'll tell you, Doc, I've got a splitting headache. My tongue feels like dry leather. Can't hold anything down. I'm anxious, restless, and even lost my sex drive. So then it's working. So um, <laughs> any more questions? Oh, thanks, Lana, for the laugh. <laughs> yes, I thought I would put a laugh in there uh, for thanks. you. We do have uh, several questions, and I will just say that if we're not able to get to all of them, I will send them to Sherry, and okay. um, if she wants to answer them and has time to do that, then we will include those in the Q&A that we will post and share, even if we're not able to get them to, to them today. Um, okay. We do have a question um, related to uh, the higher prevalence of suicide uh, with individuals over the age of 65, asking mm -hmm. if there's any studies that have shown what um, method, I guess, of suicide is most common, if you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the the highest level of completed suicide is among uh, men who are 65 and older, and it's uh, by gun. Okay, All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the next, the next, the next thing. This is a really good question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see increased seasonal affective disorder in older populations? I mean, is there that more is prevalence? with the seasonal yeah i don't know empirically i'll do some research will you send that one to me lana and i'll do some research sure on will. that i would say um like sub subjectively i tend to see um more um in practice uh 
especially this year since winter seems to be going on forever. Um, yes, it does. But <laughs> it does. So I, I would, I, I would subjectively, I would say yes, but I don't know that that is truly the case. So I'll, I'll do some research and find out. Sure, great, thank you. Uh, someone is asking if you know if or you could repeat uh, the name of the website that you mentioned about the ten signs of dementia article. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I think it was the on Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And it's www.alz.org. And, and Laura, and the if you want to, is called the Ten Signs of Ten Signs of Dementia. dementia. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just going to say, Laura, Laura Shelley's typing this for us, and she's going to she'll include okay. that um, in the the actual the website. But it is again www.alz.org. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I think you may have answered this, but maybe you can repeat um, if you specifically see depression more in males or females um, in your practice. That's, uh, that's a really good question. I would say it's pretty equal. Um, I am surprised at how, how many men are willing and um, seek out therapy. Um, and it's one of two things. I either have um, men who are like, oh, no, I don't need it, or men who are calling me saying, why haven't you called me to get in yet? <laughs> you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it is interesting to me because I typically think of this group of men who are 65 and above as being less likely to engage in therapy. But I would say I have pretty pretty even um, men to women different issues that, right that that is very interesting mm -hmm. um, I will say that I think one of the primary issues that I see people for and I think is a big contributor to depression is that is that uh, purpose um, finding purpose later in life um, everybody wants to feel like they have a meaning and a reason to be here um, and I think when, especially men stop working, uh, women too now though, um, you know, or their kids have grown and finding like what brings them meaning and purpose. And we do a lot of exploring around that. That is true. And I, you know, I can understand if you've, you know, had 40 years or more in a career and then suddenly you don't mm -hmm. have that daily, um, routine and feeling as though you're contributing in a way I I can definitely see how that would be very that could be very difficult. Absolutely. Um, yep. So someone is asking um if if um what your suggestions would be um if uh, a person is already taking antidepressant medication um they are nonverbal but they have lost significant amount of weight in um, the last several months uh, they lost they have lost interest in eating and drinking would you recommend further like maybe medical diagnostic testing or reevaluation of the medication that they are taking I would because um, anytime we see a physical change like that we want to rule out a medical issue my other question though would be is this person end of life um, because we do have patients who are toward the end of their life and do lose interest in eating and that's part of the normal process of mm -hmm. dying um, so without that information but if it, presuming that the person is not end of life I would do I would request a medical workup and review of medications um, and even have them do a depression screen um, I know that's a big push this year is is uh, to do those PHQ-9s or the um, geriatric depression scales to kind of look at the big picture of it. But I would start with a medical piece. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, several people that um, have thanked you for the information uh, that it's been very helpful. Someone has also, also mentioned uh, that um, the information you shared about the anti-Parkinson's medication um, mm -hmm. They have an individual they're working with that is 
nonverbal, but they gradually become more emotional since taking that medication for uh, Parkinson's. And that mm-hmm. they'll mention that to the rest of his team, um, maybe to take a look at that. So, um, if, several comments that. on glad. that. Yeah. I'm very glad. And then one final question. Um, someone is asking mm-hmm. if this is part of the St. Vincent Dunn Senior Renewal Center. Not familiar with that, but I don't know I if you are. I am not familiar with that either. Okay. What, what is it called, Lana? And it, uh, St. Vincent Dunn Senior, D-U-N-N Senior Renewal Center. And it may be... Um, part of the St. Vincent. They also um, provide Medicaid waiver services for intellectual Mm -hmm. and developmental disabilities. So it may be a part of that. It is in Bedford, Indiana. So um, we'll, we'll kind of take a look and, and see, but um, the uh, part that of St. Vincent that Sherry is affiliated with is the, um, I'm not going to say it right because I don't have it in front of me. Yes, I do. The, um, Medical St. Vincent's Medical Group Center for Healthy Aging. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That is, and I know St. Vincent ha- is quite large, and they have different um, services that they provide throughout the state. So, yeah. yeah, okay, it is part of the local yeah. hospital. So St. Vincent must have a local hospital or a Vincent, hospital in Bedford. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. Great. Yep. Well, um, that all. is all of the questions Fine. that I see. And um, I do, again, want to thank you, Sherry, for sharing this information. Um, you know, I think it's very helpful um, as we are, you know, the individuals that we are supporting, um, even if they are not receiving the medical model waivers, um, we do have individuals that are aging and being able to, you know, take a look at um, you know, whether it is a, a depression or a medical um, mm-hmm. issue um, will be very helpful and, and hopefully we'll be able to take this back uh, um, and share this information with the other members of their support team. So I want to thank well, you thank again you. for taking your time today to share this with us. Um, also like to thank everyone for joining us today. Our next workshop um, will be on July the 20th. So we will not have one in May or June, but we'll be back on July the 20th, 20th, also at 11.30 a.m. Eastern and 10.30 a.m. Central. Um, On that workshop, we will welcome Dr. Mary Rita Weller. She is the Assistant Professor of Social Work at Kutztown University in Pennsylvania. She'll be sharing information with us on supporting um, LGBTQ individuals that also have uh, intellectual and de- developmental disabilities. So um, I'm looking forward to that workshop. Uh, we'll be sharing that, uh, the registration and additional information on the July workshop in the upcoming week. So everybody watch for that. And again, thank you, Sherry. And thank you to everyone that's joined us today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you very much. All right. Take care.